and welcome to day two of our 17th annual Sharpen the Saw Day. I'm Peter Parts, an EMBA class four graduate and one of the volunteers who helps with this cool event we call Sharpen the Saw. Remember yesterday when we talked about if your company is hiring or if you're looking for an opportunity. Jessica has sent everyone a link leaving your, for you to leave your information, give us your name, your email address, and a brief description of the opportunity. And remember, everyone and anyone who helps a member of our EMBA family find a job opportunity gets invited to a picnic dinner with great wines, ice cold beer at my home. And I swear my wife has approved this message. We had a great day yesterday with both Ellen and Bob speaking on very pertinent topics. Ellen's talk had very useful news about what's new at RIT and how it's investing in its future. And Bob gave a profound synopsis on COVID, who is being affected and how they're being affected. And most importantly, how we should prepare ourselves in the post COVID world. If you missed these talks, you can easily go back. Jessica posted a link to both so you can hear them again. Now for our next speaker, we're leaving time at the end for Q&A. At that time, if you have any questions, drop them in the chat and we'll try to get to them. Let me tell you about our next speaker. She is a best-selling author, a syndicated columnist, a leadership consultant in high demand, a recovering lawyer, and an actress. She was profiled in People Magazine about her transition from law to a career in acting. Her column, The Suburban Outlaw, was published in the USA Today Network and the Democrat and Chronicle for over 15 years. Most recently, she starred in a one-woman show, Irma Bombeck at Wit's End, breaking box office records around the United States. Today, and today, Pam will be speaking to CEOs and leaders all over the world about how to present themselves and their mission to passion, how to find their edge, defining edge as exploring, dreaming, growing, and exciting. Folks, let me introduce Pam Sherman, our speaker today. Pam, thank you for coming and helping us find our edge. Pam, it's all yours. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. I can't tell you how excited that this day has actually come. We have been talking about this uh, for quite a while. So um, uh, it's wonderful to see you all here. Thank you for having me, Peter. And the topic for today, uh, how do you sharpen your saw? I like to call it uh, using the tools of outlaw leadership. Uh, I'd like to think that uh, it's the best kind of outlaw, an outlaw who wants to make a difference in the world, an impact, uh, to really think about how can you be who you are, wherever you are, in order to change the world. Nothing I'm going to talk about today isn't something that you don't already know at the core. But as I ponder the new world order uh, post-pandemic, we actually are seeking more authentic and transparent leadership. We've come into our homes, we're operating our businesses with dogs running around and children in the background. And how do we still show up with energy, with focus, with clarity, but still retain who we are at the core? And I believe that's about going to the edge of your leadership. So uh, I always like to start with a story about how I found my own edge. Um, this is a picture of what was recently named one of the most beautiful cities in the world and one of the natural wonders of the world in Cape Town. This is Table Mountain. Cape Town, South Africa is a, an amazing place. And I got to visit there a few years ago, speaking to leaders on an African tour between Nigeria and South Africa. And when I arrived in Cape Town, this mountain looms all around the city. You can't help but see it. You see it as you land. I was presenting in the tallest building in downtown Cape Town and a cannon went off and literally you had to peel me off the ceiling because I am always telling people to go to the edge of their leadership, to see out beyond the edge, to go outside of their comfort zone. But I'm actually a liar and I'm terrified of heights. 
So the entire time I was there, people kept asking me, have you been to the top of Table Mountain? There's a funicular that goes up and it's 360 de degree resolve. So you can see all the way up. And all I could think was, no, I'm not going there. Um, I'm too busy. I would use every excuse. But I realized if I was going to help people to go to the edge of their leadership, to figure out what could they do to help grow themselves, their teams, their families, their communities, I needed to take that moment on for myself. So at the end of my trip, I took that funicular clinging to the revolving pole the entire time. And I got out and you know what happened? It really wasn't all that scary. It literally was just a table. But as I walked around the top of that beautiful mountain, I realized I had to push myself to the edge. And this is the picture that uh, I took or someone my family took of me standing out on the edge. And I closed my eyes, I took a deep breath and I realized that I could actually see for miles. You felt like you could touch the sky. Possibilities became greater when I was willing to go to the edge of my comfort zone. And I had a bungee cord attached. That was my team, my family. My big joke is that my husband could have gone either way, depending on how he felt about me, push or pull. Um, but for some reason I made it. And that's what I'm hoping to get you to think about. What do you need to do? We've all been taken to the edge of our leadership. Everything we thought was true, we've been taken out of our comfort zone. We've act, had to act with courage and agility and resilience, all the things we were seeking. So how can we take what we've learned from this pandemic and really integrate it into who we are as leaders so that we can go beyond where we were when this pandemic started and go beyond the challenges of the pandemic into the new world order? So I like to start with getting to know my audience a bit. Uh, and here's the way I'm going to do it. It's a very reductive exercise. Um, if you had to think of one word that defines you at the core, and I'm going to open up the chat so I can watch and see the answers, I would love to hear for anybody, what is the one word that defines you? Now, two rules. It can't be situational, late, tired, or hungry. And your friends and family would have to agree with your word because there's always the guy who says he's inspirational and everyone is standing behind him saying, yeah, no, that's not the word I would use. So my word, just to get us started, is energy. Um, I hope you're sensing that even in this virtual world. Uh, that's my core word. It's one of my power words and it's the word that I hope to show up with every time. So go ahead and put into the chat, creative, authentic, reliable, joyful, that's awesome, organized, determined, humorous, spirited, kind. These are great words, can do, there's always a hyphen. Uh, funny, trustworthy, generous, optimistic. Um, this is fantastic. Think of the power that is in this room. We have mm -hmm. determined people, problem solvers, curious people, people who push. Typically, I find um, that that word is how you show up. And frankly, if you're not showing up in accordance to your core defining word, you're not being true to yourself and you're not giving the audience the gift of who you are as a leader. The interesting thing is in doing this experiment with audiences all over the world, very few <laughs> use this word. It's pretty fascinating, right? In fact, that's not true. There were two. One was a 21-year-old intern in San Francisco at a very large company who said to me, my mother told me I'm a leader and I believe her. And then the other is a leadership developer in a company that I work with right here in Rochester who said, how can I lead leaders if I am not a leader at the core? I believe, however, that every word that you used in the chat, creative, doer, push, whatever that word was, that is who you are as a leader. Now, if we're gonna talk about leadership, I wanna share my definition of leadership. And um, I'm an attorney by training, uh, Peter told you that. I like to think of the famous answer of Justice Potter Stewart who when uh, commenting on obscenity, I don't know what it is, but I know it when I see it. We often have many, many different definitions of leadership, but we may not have the same definition, but we know it when we feel it. 
my definition, which encompasses and really was the launch of all of my work with leaders around the world, came from my husband's first boss's credenza. He went on to become chairman of Kraft General Foods. And I'll never forget my husband coming home and telling me about this plaque that sat on his boss's desk. And it was this, leadership is the ability to communicate a vision and gain commitment to it. It's quite a perfect sentence, right? It's not enough to have a vision. You have to be able to communicate it. And it's not enough to have a vision without followership and most important, emotionally committed followers. That's where leadership arises. When I read that, the first thing I thought of is, oh, leadership is not hierarchical at all. Everyone can be a leader with capital L based upon their behavior. It's a great quote from Don McGannon, an advertising executive, leadership is action, not position. That definition of leadership has taken me around the world to work with leaders like you, leaders of organizations, of NGOs, of, uh, of their families or in their communities who are seeking the same thing you're seeking. How can I show up true to who I am and make a difference and impact my audiences with my vision of the world? Now, why me? Why am I here? Um, mainly because Peter called me um, and I was, uh, I was thrilled to receive the call to think that somebody actually pays attention to my writing. Um, you put a lot of content out there. But uh, yes, uh, here in Rochester, I like to say I'm a minor celebrity in Rochester, New York. For 15 years, I wrote a column called The Suburban Outlaw. That's me in my old cornfield in Pittsford, New York, where I wrote the column for 15 years, sharing stories from my life about what I called a suburban outlaw, an honest, irreverent man or woman who wants to make a difference with an edge. And it, I was really lucky to be able to write that column and frankly, make fun of my husband in print. And by the way, he helps me write it. We've been married for 36 years and it definitely keeps us fresh. Um, but that's not where my story starts. My story actually starts in the second grade uh, where I grew up on Staten Island, New York. I used to play piano with the door wide open, hoping that a wandering talent agent would hear me sing and cast me on Broadway. Um, but they don't wander the streets of Staten Island. And I came from a very traditional family. So being an actor was akin to being, well, an ax murderer. So my parents uh, encouraged me to take a different path. And I decided to go on to law school. But a funny thing happened on the way to my secure profession in a recession a long time ago and far away, my law firm went out of business. And after that time, I decided to take the leap, uh, bungee cord of team attached, and became a full-time working actor in Washington, D.C. Cue laughter. Um, after I was profiled in People Magazine for ditching my day job to pursue my dreams, just to show you that the media didn't get it right, the day job ditched me, I got a phone call from the head of training at the Department of Justice Antitrust Division. And this is how I recall the conversation. She said to me, can you help me make my lawyers more interesting? I said, no, it's really not possible, <laughs> but uh, uh, they're very interesting right now, I think. Um, but for me, it was uh, a revelatory moment. I thought about really what is the objective of a great lawyer? It's to convince and persuade with the story that they have to tell using themselves as the messenger. And that's kind of what an actor does if you think about it. You all suspend your disbelief you put yourself in the seat, you enter that world that the actor has created, and you believe and are influenced to join them on that storytelling journey. Uh, that work uh, that I did with the Department of Justice helped me to grow a company um, that really got started here in Rochester, New York, working with leaders all over the world, from Cincinnati to Saudi Arabia, from Milwaukee to Morocco, and every place in between. I've had the opportunity to help leaders grow their presence and commit to who they are and make a difference in the world with their leadership. Um, but it doesn't really matter. I thought I should share this with you. People really don't want to know about any of that. They just want to know, have I seen you in anything? Um, and if you Google sexy cheerleaders in a movie called The Replacements, I am not one of them. I, uh, I was one of my um, greatest casting coups. I was cast as the shocked mom. Uh, that's the part that I play in real life uh, all the time right now. And a funny thing happens, you know, as you go on the journey of life, 
I had given up being a full-time actor and was asked to go back on stage three years ago playing my idol. And if you don't know who she is, go look her up. She was the most prolific columnist of her time and a champion of women's rights. And in Women's History Month, we really should be celebrating the work of Irma Bombeck and what she did to share stories of women who wouldn't otherwise be recognized for what they do and uh, the work that they do. And I think about the, uh, what we heard yesterday about women leaving the workforce and the work being done by Reshma Sajani and others to create the Women's Marshall Plan. Irma Bombeck would have been all over that to make sure that women um, were being celebrated and compensated for the work that they do. I learned so much in going back on stage about leadership, how to collaborate, how to be led when you're a leader by other leaders, how to be willing to trust those you collaborate with, that what they are supposed to do will show up, i.e. lights will go on, props will be there as supposed to be, and standing alone backstage in that moment before entering by myself to do a 90 minute one person show, I learned what it really takes to have the courage of leadership that while it is alone, you are doing it together. And it's an interplay between you and all of your audiences to create success. So to that end, I'd like to take you through some of my philosophy of leadership um, before we can have a, converse, a further conversation about how this might work for each of you personally and collectively for your organizations. So, uh, so the name of my business is Sherman Edge, and that's because my husband says I'm edgy. He's from Geneva, New York, not Switzerland. Um, but it occurred to me that that actually meant something. It means that I have the ability to explore connections and connect to my audience more deeply. I dream because really what is a strategy but a dream with bullet points and so we need to get back to some visionary leadership uh, in our organizations. What can we do con to continue growing programs like this that uh, RIT and Peter Parts have created for you where you sharpen your saw all the time? And then how can I help you do one thing differently based upon the time you're spending with me so you can ignite the world with who you are? So starting with explore. Um, to me, this is all about exploring possibilities. And as a leader, taking the time to answer this question, why am I here? Why do I lead? What is my purpose in the world? Uh, what is my mission? How do I drive my, my purpose? And then ultimately, what's my vision? This is one of my favorite quotes from Mark Twain. The two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you figure out why. So a lot of leaders, and this is so fascinating, have a purpose statement for their company. And I was never forget working with 300 CEOs at a conference. I asked them to raise their hand and said, how many of you have a purpose statement, a mission statement, and a vision statement for your company? All 300 hands shot up. How many of you have a purpose statement, a mission statement, and a vision statement for your own leadership? Three hands, three, quite a percentage. And that work is critically important, actually articulating it. And for those of you who are established as leaders, really, it's not that hard to go through the journey of articulating your why. Um, my why is very simple. It's to share my energy with the world. I have a story that supports that from my past that brings me to my why. I incorporated my core defining word, and it's a very simple statement. Your mission, actually, this one's a little harder because it might change over time. I call it your how. How will you accomplish your purpose? How do you make a difference in the world? So taking the time to do that, that I believe requires a further, more in-depth journey into understanding who you are as a leader and what's important to you. So typically I would work with leaders having them articulate what are three core values that drive your leadership. How can you incorporate those values into a mission statement that will actually help you to um, act and behave that way consistently? So my core values, and I'd love it if people would be willing to share a little bit of their core values in the chat. Um, my three that I have always focused on are humor um, and uh, integrity, which I define as accountability. I do what I say I'm going to do. I'm going to show up with excellence. 
And then uh, the third one is, well, it was family, but then they started to piss me off. So pardon my French. I've decided to add, I broadened it to connectedness. It was really important for me to broaden that up. So if anybody's done this work and they want to share uh, into the chat, some core values that are uh, really consistent and show up for you every time. It'd be great to see those as well. I'll give you a moment to humility, honesty, work. So balance, thank you, Tia, that's great. Fun, yes, it's very, you know, by the way, I rarely get things like joy and fun, um, and there's been all this research about how so many people want and expect joy, uh, but they don't actually articulate it as a core value. Connections, love it. Hi, Mike. <laughs> That's great. Accountability, integrity. And my favorite is, you know, I'll be working with a group of bankers and they'll say, well, integrity goes without saying. And I always tell them, go ahead and say it. So, so take the time to do that work on your core values find and create a mission statement for your leadership and then see how it changes your behavior, track it. The following thing you have to pay attention to is, well, who am I serving? Who are the audiences for my leadership? And because ultimately there's a fantastic new book out by Francis Fry, a professor at Harvard called Unleashed. And uh, I love that she wrote it so I don't have to. Uh, and basically she always talks about how leadership is about who you empower not about you. I mean, you do have to go through this personal assessment and journey, but ultimately, and you all know this in leadership, that leadership is ultimately who do we serve? Who do we want to impact? And really understanding our audiences and their needs first. The next part of Explore is, well, how do you show up? How do these core values balance with your mission in order to meet your audience's needs? This quote from a Amy Cuddy, I think really sums it all up. Amy Cuddy, who is a researcher on body language, who wrote also an amazing book called Presence. It's just simply titled Presence. And yes, I know from an academic standpoint, some of her research has been placed into question, but anecdotally, uh, her beliefs really work. So she talks about presence being the state of being attuned to and able to comfortably express our true thoughts, feelings, values, and potential. So from my perspective, you can't have leadership and know who you are without also considering how you show up. My concept of leadership is you get to be who you are, wherever you are, in order to impact your audience. And that requires an understanding and a cultivation of your presence. And frankly, in this virtual world, we need to all step it up. We need to consider how we're showing up actually virtually. We can't forget all the rules of engagement and connection and frankly, voice and body language just because we're living in a virtual webinar world. Those who step into that with energy and think about my, how is my presence impacting my audience in the virtual world, those are the ones who are going to be successful in our new world order because virtual is not going away. We heard that yesterday. It's all about digital. So dream, uh, as I said, I really do believe that a, a, a strat plan is just a, a dream with bullet points. So you've got to do the work on vision. I call it your where. And how does this relate to leadership? This is a great quote from Stuart Friedman who wrote a book about holistic leadership. Leadership vision is the essential means for focusing attention on what matters most, what you want to accomplish in life and what kind of leader you wish to be. You know, as you go through this week of sharpening the saw, I hope you'll consider how can I be changed by what I'm learning here? How can I take this and incorporate it into a new vision? We're all thinking about what's the vision for the new normal, not the old normal, but what's where we're coming out of in this pandemic. The world has changed, but that doesn't mean that leadership has changed. We still need leaders who are visionary, who are thinking about what's important to them, and what is their legacy? So to that end, um, just a few tools on visualization, something that actors use all the time, and it's an incredible important tool to cultivate. I used to tell people to go out and state your goals out loud and they are more likely to come true. 
Well, it actually turns out that there's research that shows if you state a goal out loud, it is less likely to come true. Apparently some hormone is released uh, where you get satisfied and you don't have to actually do the work. But the difference is if you share it with specificity, you know, it's, you can have a big, hairy, audacious goal, but it really has to be specific to you and your organization. Um, so the example would be, I, you know, I want to get healthy. Well, great goal. I'm going to go on a diet. Great goal. But you actually have to lay out the plan. So to be visionary, think about writing the story of what hasn't happened yet. So write it for yourself. Do some visionary work. And that requires thoughtfulness and really a big picture point of view. Um, the other side of dream is this. The stories of our past illuminate our path to the future. So think of the great storytellers and how leadership storytelling is a critical component of your leadership presence. But also start cultivating the stories of your past. I love the work of Marshall Gans, who's a professor at the Kennedy School, who talks about the fact that you really only need to know three stories for your leadership. The story of you, the story of we, our collective, and the story of our call to action. There must be a story from the past that is helping you on your vision to the future. When I think of the stories of purposeful leaders and how they've changed my life, these are three who I admire. From Lauren Gillis, who is a uh, CEO and founder of an NGO in South Africa uh, called Relate, where she creates bracelets that make a difference uh, for senior citizens and students in South Africa and have raised over $20 million for charities around the world or Amina Sloawi, who is a disability rights activist who literally had a vision of building the first rehab hospital in all of North Africa. And then that's little Tracy Weinstein who collected 30,000 shoes for Soul for Souls here in Rochester, New York in order to send them back to her native country. Think about the impact that you can make in having a vision and then in sharing the story of how you fulfill that vision. Um, so next is the grow part. And uh, this is one of my favorite quotes. I, I found it uh, actually on a button at the Susan B. Anthony house here in Rochester, New York. And uh, that's a picture of the ski hill in Dubai. I, I know that RET had a connection to Dubai or probably still does. Um, and when I went there to, uh, to do some leadership work, I'll never forget my husband telling me, well, we know you're afraid of heights and we want you to conquer them. So why don't you go skiing inside that mall in Dubai? And I told him that basically he was just scared I was gonna go shopping in the mall in Dubai. Um, I did visit it uh, and it's, uh, it was too scary. It was still too high, so I didn't do it. But I do try and push myself. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you might have a fear of public speaking. It is a, it's a fear greater than death, actually. And uh, it, it's, um, it, would it surprise you, given that I get to do this for a living and that I get to help other people grow their presence, that I actually get nervous every time. Um, so that feeling, that excitement, it pushes me to grow. What am I going to do differently this time? How am I going to connect to my audience, especially in this virtual world? We have done all these scary things this year, and we have to remind ourselves of what have we overcome in this year of the pandemic? Where were we? Where did we get to? And how are we going to take that learning of moving beyond fear to courage and resilience and use it? So to me, um, even pushing myself, there's a great quote from uh, Sarah Bernhardt who used to get um, so nervous before every performance, she got ill. And another actor said to her, um, I never get nervous before I go on. And it's really one of my favorite quotes. And she said, well, people without talent rarely do. <laughs> so consider what are we going to move beyond our fear into? How can we push ourselves to keep that you know, that, that feeling of I'm about to go on stage in everyday leadership. I call it um, being fierce. Um, you know, we're all out there being told to be bold and fierce, F-I-E-R-C-E. -E. But I I'd like to say I'm scared and I do it anyway. Um, there's a great quote from an acting teacher who said, there's scared and you do and scared and you don't. And you're going to be scared anyway. So you might as well do it. And that's been a philosophy that I've lived with um, my whole life. Leadership is scary. Frankly, it should be. 
um, people without talent rarely consider what's the, the stressors of leadership, but it's pushing beyond that that builds resilience. It's understanding that courage isn't the absence of fear, but pushing through it. So the grow part is, what are you going to do to keep that feeling of fierceness um, going even in, as the mundane begins to return to our lives? The next part of grow is how can we continue to be curious? This is one of my favorite quotes from Eartha Kitt. I'm learning all the time. The tombstone will be my diploma. The fact that so many of you are here today at lunch to hear about leadership and you're gonna be here all week means that you're continuing to grow your leadership through RIT and using this incredible network. Um, and for so many of you who returned to receive an EMBA, uh, it was while you were working full time. So you're already curious, how can you grow to the next level of your leadership? One way to do that would be to actually step back. Um, I know that you're filling so much of your day with your work and with trying to grow and with our family and our children. And I saw work-life balance is really important. Well, I believe that when we're actually uh, working at as our best selves, that's where balance shows up. And balance is really about time management plus prioritization. But part of it also is about self-compassion and the work of positive psychology and uh, really thinking about happiness. Yes, we can actually move towards happiness. Um, there are some tools that you can use. And this also grows your presence because it will grow your energy. It will grow your ability to step back. One thing is to be mindful. Um, the thing I have implored to my clients for the last 12 years is to take some mindful time, whether that be journaling. There was a great article recently uh, that I saw about as you move up the ladder, you actually should be journaling more. How do you keep track of leadership lessons learned? How do you keep track of the stories you need to share? How do you just do your thinking? And writing with a pen actually commits it to your, self -con your, uh, to your consciousness. And it's critically important as a tool. The other thing is mindfulness. Um, I actually had been telling people to use Headspace and struggled with it myself. I'm proud to say since May of last year, I now actually have meditation time 10 minutes every single day. It's not, you don't have to spend 20 minutes sitting in cross leg if you can, good for you. Um, but for me, it's a real challenge and overcoming that challenge was critically important. The other thing is gratitude and really taking the time to recognize those who have uh, brought you to where you are. But the interesting thing about gratitude, when we express it and put it in writing and share it with others, it actually raises our serotonin levels. And there's a lot of people, and I'm getting this from a lot of my clients, who are getting Zoom fatigue or pandemic fatigue, even though we're in such a hopeful state in the world, um, so I actually have them double down on a lot of these tools, uh, writing down three things that they're grateful for every day, writing down three positive things that happened in a day, and it can't be a positive negative, start using these tools. And then this is, to me, the greatest thing that we have to grow, given what's happening in the world, is making a difference in the world. Uh, we talked about yesterday the corporate contract and who are the stakeholders and companies making a commitment to uh, corporate social responsibility. This is Adam Grant. His work is seminal. Uh, that giving is the miracle drug with no side effects. Our communities have been changed by this pandemic. And the difference that we can make with the skills that you have in your leadership, both in your companies, in your communities, and your families, can make a huge difference in this next phase of time in the world. So I'm going to close out the excite part. Um, by thinking about how might you be changed by this time that you're spending together in sharpening your saw, spending it with the incredible organizers and with the incredible resources that you're gonna have. Um, I have a commitment whenever I speak to an audience is to see how you can be changed from the time we're spending together. What commitment can you make to change how you show up to commit to maybe doing the work on purpose and mission, to maybe commit to sending a letter of gratitude to somebody who made a difference for you. 
Um, these are some of the things that I like to talk about to use this network. It's an incredible network. Craft a vision, do one thing every day. Um, be happy, speak up, use your voice, keep a journal, express your gratitude, uh, be good to yourself. And um, number 10, I just threw in there because I think it's really important. I call it losing the psychos. Um, these are the people who are naysayers to your vision, who may be obstacles to your vision. Find a way to, uh, I had one woman say to me, well, that's my husband. And I said, just turn over, you know, um, uh, or find a way to persuade and influence them otherwise. So I would love before I close out and we move to questions um, for people to throw into the chat, what's one thing you commit to doing differently? And it may be just something that I sparked in you that you remembered um, if I've worked with you before, or if this is something you, I said, nothing we're talking about isn't something that you don't already know, but what's one thing you might do differently because of the time I've spent with you or because of what you're, you, you'd like to commit to do differently for your leadership as a result of this week of sharpening the saw. I'd love to see some answers in the chat so I can read them out loud. Create my own, thank you, Tara. Create your own leadership mission. Do something every day that scares me, craft a vision, fantastic. Meditation, take time for learning with your team. Three positive things a day, write them down. Weekly gratitude recap, journal. That's fantastic. Right, simple, simple tools. Um, so as I close out my portion, and then we go into a conversation um, with Peter and answering some question, I wanna close and closing out with, that impact of that trip to South Africa and what it meant for me. Um, I decided to create a new vision. So uh, this is my son and I, who's much older now, uh, traveling through South Africa. Um, and these are the senior citizens. I decided to um, work with my friend at Relate, and I don't know if you all can see my wrist here, uh, to make a bracelet that would be made by senior citizens and students in South Africa to benefit um, programs here in Rochester, New York, uh, where students are trying to make a difference. And one of those programs is Young Women's College Prep. Uh, and I'm so excited because this school was an all-girl charter school that was started here in Rochester. And I've been committed to the vision of those girls who committed in seventh grade, often many of them to be the first in their families to go to college. And the commitment was that they would all graduate high school and all go on to college. This is a picture of the first graduating class three years ago. Many of those students are at RIT now. We made the bracelet and we started selling them at Wegmans and we sell them through my website. And each bracelet makes a difference for a student at Young Women's College Prep. My mission and my vision is to support other leaders' visions to see that they can accomplish them and that they can grow in their leadership. So I can't thank you enough, Peter, for reaching out and for the opportunity to speak to this incredible RIT community. I was so excited to hear about all the things. Uh, I have supported many leaders on the RIT campus, but I'm really most excited about that Performing Arts Center, woohoo, um, because I know that uh, uh, we could really use that here in Rochester. And I am a huge fan of RIT Tigers. So go Tigers and thank you for having me. And I'm excited to have a conversation with Peter and with all of you. Pam, that was absolutely great. Lots of gratitude for what you did. I think a couple of things you'd be happy to know that um, with your South Africa trip, um, the, the RIT EMBAs every year go on a trip around the world. Jeff Davis does this and picks some incredible locations. And three years ago, he took the entire class to South Africa and we have been to the mountaintop. It's not scary yeah. until you stand on the edge, right? <laughs> it is very tall and there is a very big edge. 
Actually, people were pulling all the way down. It was crazy. Oh, my, my favorite is they tell you, have you been up the lion's path? You know, if people have died going up that, like, no, I'm not going up the lion's path. <laughs> but it's sure. a, just a beautiful city. And um, I have a lot of great friends. They're great leaders in business who um, I was lucky to speak there for the Young Presidents Organization, which is an international business organization that was founded here in Rochester, New York. Um, and its entire mission is better leaders through education and idea exchange, similar to what you're trying to do this, um, at what you do at uh, RIT and what you're doing this week. Right. We've, we've got a couple questions that have come in. Let me try to, to make my way through them. Um, Pam, when do you take time to reflect on your strengths in order to make a difference? When do you take time? So it's really interesting. It, every day. So I... Uh, the work that I do with my clients, and that's why the, the meditation was such a struggle. I felt, again, I, I'm very, integrity is a core value. So I want to make sure that I'm showing up the way I um, am asking my leaders to show up that I work with. And so I, I think the meditation, that thoughtful time has really helped to expand my, um, uh, the strength for me, because I'm, look at me, I'm, I'm not, you know, energy is my thing. Uh, I also, um, I find end of the day and beginning of the day. So I think first thing in the, like find the time in the day where you are most able to stop and look inward and take that time. So whenever I have a pushback from a client, I'm not going to journal, Pam, that's not going to happen. I, I ask them, you know, how do you start your day? Fire up the computer, start answering emails. Stop, take a breath, do that journaling. So I think you have to personally find when is the best time of day for you to do that, the step back individual leadership work. And so important to do. Every day, every day. And, you know, I actually have, like, I, I, I do, I negotiate with my clients. <laughs> like, I actually have, for those who love process, we create an Excel spreadsheet where they have to check off. I, I had one leader where he just was not showing up well for his team. So I said, okay, you have to go out and ask people how they are and wait to hear the answer. And uh, we made a, I made him check it off on an Excel spreadsheet. It's something Marshall Goldsmith, who's a fantastic leadership coach, and you might all be aware, familiar with his um, incredible work. I think he's pushing 90 and he keeps an Excel spreadsheet where he has a coach check in with him at the end of the week of what did he do to move his strength and his leadership forward. Isn't that amazing? Other than Irma Bombeck, who are some of your other heroes? Oh, it's so funny you should ask that. I, I'm, I'm leading a, a group, a, a mentor circle with young women from around the world. They're from Malaysia to Rome. And, uh, and I had to answer the question that uh, it's, it's a really interesting story. I wrote a play, a one woman show with the head of the theater department at American University. A, a, you know, one woman show. It sounds like I don't like to act with other actors, but uh, <laughs> The play was a, was a comedy about the death of my best friend. Trust me, people laughed, they cried. It was better than cats. But sh we wanted to incorporate some women from history. And I could, I don't know if I had too many women from history that were special to me, um, but I, uh, I couldn't come up with any names. And for purposes of the play, I finally came up with um, three. Anna Freud, my mother was a Freudian psychoanalyst and I thought Anna Freud, who was a child psychologist was so fascinating to me. And then the second one was Mary Todd Lincoln, who, if you think about it, Mary Todd Lincoln suffered so much. And uh, I had played her once as an actor and I, um, she was in the end of her life, she was known for shopping too much. Seriously, there were all these scandals and I just found her fascinating. And then uh, again, a, a Hannah Senesh, who had emigrated to Palestine in 1939 before the war, and then was trained as a spy and paratrooper and parachuted back behind enemy lines to Hungary, to Budapest. And she's a beloved poet um, in Israel. She didn't make it through the war. She was captured and was executed the day before the Russians liberated the city. She was 22 years old. And uh, so you think about the impact of her stories and, uh, and, and I would say the last one, and I'm so lucky that I get to live here is Susan B. Anthony. And, you know, I, I send everybody to Seneca Falls to the National Women's Hall of Fame 
I'm a huge uh, champion of the work there. So I, I think Women's History Month, I have, a, if, you, if you want my point of view, Peter, you want me to answer this one? Um, we make up half the population. We should have half the months, right? <laughs> so um, I hope people will celebrate Women's History Month every month. And I'd like to talk about women, the future of women um, more than even women. The women in history are the stories that illuminate our path to the future. That'll probably be something my wife is going to talk about at dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yes, awesome. Yeah. What's, what were some of the tolls that you had to pay or your costs that you had to pay to live your dreams? Tough well, part. fear, um, you know, I was part of an organization. I'd always thought, saw myself as being, you know, pretty oddly conservative, given that I wanted to be an actor, right? Um, and doing it by myself. I, uh, you know, I, I, if you think about it, actors work in teams. We typically aren't by ourselves. We love to collaborate. We love to have everybody together. So deciding to start a business, and this was really my business, um, you know, well, it was started back when I left the practice of law. That was just an idea of things I did committing to it as a business happened about 12 in 2008 9 in the last recession and I was thinking about going back to practice law and I because we you know from a financial um, standpoint had I had to get back in the game living a creative life is fantastic but it's not remunerative in our society so I had to figure out a way of how could I take my skills combine them and make a difference. And uh, actually one of my first clients and champions is Sharon Napier, who is a graduate of your program as well. And uh, I credit her with, uh, well, tell me what you do. I need a proposal, get in here. And it, it sort of pushed me off the edge to doing this. Uh, and, and honestly, it, it's really, I was scared. Probably my biggest uh, toll was my own story in my head of what I had to offer. And how do you create a network of like-minded people? You've got a mission. How do you get a network around you that supports your mission? So interesting. I believe a network isn't about um, what um, you can gain from others. It's what you can um, give to them. And I think it's really important to look out there uh, and give people kudos, uh, send out gratitude, tell them how their work has touched your life. That's when you can start developing a relationship and then staying in touch. You know, I, I grew up in a time when I used to send out articles, like clip them and mail them off to people. And I still do it. Uh, I think that's really important. Um, and I, the first thing when we went on lockdown and literally I watched all of my engagements, you know, go away. I said, okay, I need to go and check on my people. Just tell them I'm here. And, and that was it. And it was really with just kindness. I, I think it's not asking for something. It's about um, what can I give? How can I make a difference for you? Another great question. How do you suggest we push our organizations that are slow to change to move toward accepting change and increasing the pace of change? Great question. <laughs> well, it's interesting. You all had to change instantly in the last year, right? You had to go from probably an actual uh, organization to a virtual organization. You, you've just done it. So I think we have to double down on sharing the stories of what we did successfully to make change and innovate as a result of a challenge, an external challenge that came to us. And then say, okay, what did we do? And go through that process of, um, of solidifying it and incorporating it into the culture of the organization. There's not one company that wasn't affected and didn't, or organization of any kind that wasn't affected by the lockdown last March. So it's really, I think, and it has to come from the top. Um, innovation, it's so interesting because uh, I, I worked with a company that was really a disruptor in the state of education, Kaplan University, which is, you know, was the first to have an online law school. They were the people who figured out how to do this in a mass way. And every academic institution now has a digital presence. Um, so as hard as it was from the story that was shared yesterday, 
uh, this program, the CMBA program, I just learned has always been virtual. So why do we forget that we were innovators? And uh, you know, we're everyone. Change is happening all the time. We've all just changed from being together in the room today, right? Pam, I know we've got a hard stop, but I want to ask one more question. Oh, okay. Wait, how are we? Oh, yeah, yeah. We've got time. Um, you've you've given us a lot of great ideas and things to do and things that we should be aware of. What is the best piece of advice you were ever given? Just do it, <laughs> you know. Um, I, I think it's that scared and you do and scared and you don't. I, I, I quote it to my children all the time. It's, uh, it's really, close your eyes and jump in feet first. And uh, I mean, we, we were all pushed off the edge of a cliff, right? Last March, myself included. And yes, it's important to plan and think, but also to know that everything you have, that's why I am very clear that I talk about leadership with a little L. <laughs> I believe that our leadership is all within us and that we are all leaders at the core and have the opportunity to be leaders. Um, so the best piece of advice was, what are you waiting for? <laughs> and so, uh, um, I, I hope that answers the question. It, oh, it certainly does. Um, you have given us profound advice today, something that we can all use. And I just want to say thank you very much. Standing ovation. <laughs> <laughs> can they unmute so I can hear it? Like that would be amazing. <laughs> well done. I see, I see some of the leaders that I've worked with in the past and it's, uh, I'm so impressed with all of you for taking time from your busy days to come on a webinar like this. And, uh, and Peter and uh, Jeff and uh, um, uh, Jessica, thank you so much for organizing this and for the opportunity to uh, make a difference for RIT alums. I will say I did some research, by the way, on old alums. And um, I, I'm so, <laughs> I'm blown away by the connection um, that you all have uh, to RIT and uh, wherever you are, whether you're in Rochester or beyond. So congratulations on building a fantastic network. Thank you very much. And we hope to see you performing at the Performing Arts Center that's going to be built. Maybe, uh, maybe Irma back. I'm telling you, we could fund the whole thing. Irma, she packs them in. <laughs> thank Very you so good. much, everyone. Thank you so much. And thank you for taking my call. That's great. Um, so are you going to close out, Peter? Yep, we'll go ahead and close out. We'll just let everybody know that day three is tomorrow. We've got three great guest speakers coming. And one more time, let's give a huge ovation for Pam. Pam Sherman, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Peter, happy belated birthday. Thank you. I <laughs>